when I wake up in the morning, I say thanks to Lathanda. That sunlight feels good on my skin. It keeps me warm, and let me tell you, some of the silvery moon mornings bite. So I give thanks to the Morning Lord for his light. I'm not really a vain man, but I do ask Suni to keep the wrinkles away a little bit longer. No offense to the people who do have wrinkles, I just think they're not quite for me just yet. Give me a few years, I might change my tune, but for now, Suni, keep them away a little bit longer. I head outside and I see a new building's going up. We've come a long way from some of the original architecture. Some of these buildings have designs unheard of previously that are far safer, and I'm watching this building opposite me being slowly constructed with new materials. I give thanks to Gond for these new techniques, and pray to Arathus that will bring joy and value to my city. This morning I arrived at the conclave and I was preparing these notes and I prayed to Ogma, the inspiration to strike for these notes to really flow. And for Azuth just in general? He's a pretty cool guy. I'm a wizard. It makes sense. And I wear the holy symbol of Mistra. When we think of divine magic and divine magic casters, we think amazingly, hilariously, of a man or woman of the cloth or a mighty paladin devoted to their single god, a mighty hand or fist of the deity striking in their divine name. But although primarily a single god will be the focus of prayer for a holy warrior when it comes to spells, we are polytheistic. I'm loath to say that there are rules because then I'm sure people will gladly point out all the rare but specific instances that the rules don't apply. So instead I'm going to highlight a misconception. The misconception is clerics, priests, and paladins are monotheistic. And it's a really easy mistake to make, assuming that a paladin is going to only worship one god because their cause is a singular aspect. Their spells come from a singular source. But we are all polytheistic, giving thanks and prayers to the gods in a myriad ways. A paladin of Moradin could hear that someone was murdered on the Dwarven Council and still whisper a prayer to Baal, asking that it not be their cousin. And that's okay to Moradin. Because it's to Moradin that they are devoted, and it's by Moradin's suggestions and wishes that they abide. But Moradin is only given dominion over a certain aspect of reality, known as a domain, and try as we might, we can't live within a single aspect. We, as beautiful, messy, sublime, cart wrecks of mortals, need guidance and support in many aspects, and so multiple gods exist in a cultural group, or family, or pantheon. While we're at this point in the lecture, hello, I hope that everyone's had a good day. Welcome to the first lecture in the Divine Magic series, and also apologies for the thunderstorm that is going on. Uh, the people in Silvery Moon, of course, know that it's a bit of a storm right now, but for those of you listening elsewhere, uh, just enjoy the, uh, enjoy the thunder. It's uh, lots of fun, I'm sure. Where were we? Oh yes. All the deities of Tarl are grouped into pantheons, based on the race of their progeny or on a culture within Tarl. There's an elven pantheon, there's a dwarven pantheon, and the human cultures have pantheons. The human pantheons especially are tied strongly to their geographic majority, but this is the case with the others also. The humans founded numerous cultures across Faerun, venerating local native deities, and continue to worship those deities long after the original cultures have vanished or blended into others. What's that you say? Native? Now, before you get affronted by the word native, because we have to admit that there's a great many words that have been charged by emotion, and may I just say, they should be. Words should be charged with experience and emotion. Let's make words not just something we talk with, but talk about. Anyway, back on topic. This distinction of native or foreign? No, immigrant, is largely meaningless outside of obscure theological debates, for there is absolutely no difference from the perspective of the mortal races of Tarl. Native deities are those who rose during or after the founding of this world, and they are only worshipped here. Immigrant deities are those who are worshipped on other worlds and on other planes before their followers entered Tarl via portals and other means. When Abir Tarl was young, 
the human deities of the realms were not so formal about their spheres of influence because their worshippers were not so crowded together on the sphere of Toril as to likely ever encounter one another. For a long time, a human pantheon could simply stake out a claim on a continent or large geographic area uncontested. Eventually, though, pantheons started to see intermixture between their worshippers as various groups wandered across the face of Toril, and they began to worry about how to deal with the threat to their power base that such immigrations caused. As a solution to this, they agreed upon the formation of the spheres of influence described above, also known as domains. If the realm sphere of influence those people immigrated to already had powers who possessed the same portfolios as their immigrants' old powers, one of two things would normally happen. Either the worship of the immigrants would go to the already established realm's powers, or the immigrant powers would cross to the new crystal sphere and battle with the old realm's deities for control of the contested portfolio. But who cares? It's a fun academic point, certainly, to say that the Elven Pantheon came originally from off-planet, but Toril and Larathian is just a projection of a more powerful deity whose reach extends through multiversal membranes, and actually, no, that's kind of cool. But I'm an academic, so that proves my point. Talk to an Elven farmer about that, and they'll just shrug and then ask Corellan to make the strange robed man go away. Once a deity is accepted into the pantheons of Toril, there's no real difference between the two groups since each immigrant deity has a local aspect, independent of other world-based aspects he or she might possess. It's one of the reasons why we call them creator races. They were created by the native gods, and they in turn created the faiths of their narration. Dragons, humans, lizardfolk, nagas, wanti, lokathar, doppelgangers, and the various fey races such as sprites, these are the creator races. They created the faith surrounding the native gods. Long before the time of troubles, Ao evidently created some of the powers of the realms, as well as the crystal sphere of realm space. However, he left the realm's powers to change and evolve for millennia untold, before deciding that he needed to readjust the balance of the realms and set in motion the events of the time of troubles. During those millennia, the powers split themselves, gave birth, killed each other, raised sufficiently powerful mortals to godhood, and welcomed wave upon wave of immigrant powers, brought by waves of mortal immigration from other spheres into their ranks. They were unchecked in their proliferation and self-destruction. Only after the time of troubles did Ao take an active part in the generation of new powers, the resurrection of dead realms' powers, and permission or denial of the emigration of multispheric powers into the realms. Over time, the various gods have battled for supremacy due to a... Okay, look, I lied. There are rules. Uh, due to a rule of pantheons. Within each pantheon, only one god can claim a domain. I guess that this is so that, taking again from the example above, sorry, Moradin, I guess this is so that Moradin can't take every aspect of dwarven life under the reason that he's the father. And that's a good thing, because we all know that there are just some things you can't talk about with your dad. But the downside of the domain primacy is when the gods take over other domains or are introduced. Pantheon blending through conquest or trade inevitably leads to clashes between deities of greater than demigod status. For Ao dictates that one deity or the other must reign supreme over any particular portfolio within a certain pantheon. So if a culture comes along and says, Hey, worship our god of war. He won't threaten to murder your other gods and string you along for three adventures before finally blowing your mind with an amazing quest involving his son. The current culture being blended may look upon this favorably, however the number of such worshippers really expands beyond the cult stage before members of the pantheon that claims primacy over that race, culture, or region eliminates the threat to their demands. But if it's a credible threat, then the gods will physically battle for primacy. In the end, the victor will be the primary source of worship, and the loser will either descend to demigod status or outright die. Such conflicts often manifest as clashes between rival faiths, pitting church-led armies against one another in battles in which the life of one's deity is truly at stake. Imagine a paladin of our incumbent god of war on an important quest far from home 
suddenly has their power lost, their beacon of hope is reduced to a candle of optimism, and their complement of 4th level spells shrinks to level 1 only. They petition their god, hey what did I do wrong? Receive a message! Their old god is a shadow of who they once were, and their power is so thin from lack of worship or focus of prayer that the paladin faces a choice. Continue on their path that greatly diminished in power, or come join Team Winner. Not an Oathbreaker, because their oath is to a people, culture, or ideology. But now, instead of a paladin of that little war god, now a paladin of Tempest. Imagine, out of character for a moment, being the last worshipper of a fading demigod. Because as noted above, the gods can die. It's upsetting and we don't like thinking about it, but there is a steady supply of ruined temples throughout the forgotten places of Toril that give testament to that fact. Generally speaking, barring the intervention of Eo or other superb overworld power or strange events like the Time of Troubles or the use of artifacts, the only place that a deity can truly be destroyed is on their home plane. Because of this, it's very... Very hard to destroy a deity as they're strongest on their home planes, but it's possible. We've seen this recently, historically speaking, with the murder of Mistra in Dwemerhart, which led to the Spell Plague. And I see you Spell Plague deniers out there, it did happen. Faerun's current continuity and history depends upon that fact. In general, barring the intervention of strange conditions such as the Time of Troubles, only a greater power can kill another greater power. Of course, most powers have divine allies that they will call to aid them if they're directly assaulted. In addition, powers may willingly yield parts of their portfolio or their divine energy to others to prevent their destruction. The only powers that mortals can normally hope to destroy are demigods. Demigods in the realms are rather vulnerable as deities, as in most cases their home plane of existence is the prime material plane, and their personal domains are intimately connected to the surface of Toril. Getting a power to manifest in such circumstances usually requires elaborate trickery, the help of another power, the use of an artifact, or research into some special spell or circumstance in which the power is vulnerable. And no, Cassus' avatar spell doesn't count, as that took Mistra's power, and she sacrificed her life herself in order to save the weak. One other way exists for a power to die, and this is for it to have no more worshippers, to intentionally cause a power's death through this effect is difficult even for the most greater powers. Uh, basically, all the worshippers of a deity have to die, or the power has to gradually lose worshippers so slowly that it does not realize its inevitable fate and, until it can do little to stop it. Powers can hang on as demi-powers as long as they have even one worshipper. And even after they lose that worshipper, it takes them a while to wither away while they cling to the last bits of deific substance from the use of their name, their sovereignty over the principles and ideals in their portfolio, and even the awe inspired by tales about them as myths or parables. During this time, they would make every effort to get anyone to worship them, to effectively ensure the death of such a deity in all likelihood would have to be imprisoned on its home plane and rendered unable to communicate with any mortal being. Eventually then, it would die. However, death doesn't necessarily end the career of a deity on Toril. The possibility of resurrection always exists, as evidenced by the recent return of Bane. Small cults dedicated to the resurrection of one lost deity or another appear everywhere in Faerun. Sometimes a dead deity retains enough power to provide divine backing to a handful of worshippers, uh, occasionally another deity masquerades in the guise of a de dead deity in hopes of expanding its portfolio. And as, of course, as we've discussed previously, dead deities can still be reached as vestiges. In order to live again as a deity, a power must be worshipped and cannot have been utterly destroyed, which is theoretically possible, uh, sages assure us. Sure might not be the right word here, uh, but it would be involving massive destructive efforts on the astral plane after the location and identification of the proper co divine corpse island. Yeah, you heard right, corpse island. A deity when dead will still travel through the astral sea, their corpse floating for eternity. Horrifying. 
then something must be done to suddenly and massively direct a great deal of worship into the deity. This involves a prolonged ritual in which the dead power's name is repeatedly invoked. Often massive quantities of offerings of the type most favoured by the power are also made, and sometimes artifacts are used to somehow direct the power generated by the ceremony more efficiently to the deity. Finally, Ao must decide to let the dead power re-establish a connection with the realms. Without the tacit consent of Ao, even the most precisely and fervently executed ritual is all for naught. The religion practice over most of Faerun involves the worship of a collection of powers which are not generally related by blood. The religion practice in Chult, for example, is the worship of only two deities, and a collection of ancestral place and animal spirits, along with a regard for the force of nature. The Saldarine are an elven family created and loved by Corellin, and it's expected to worship them all as they all represent a different aspect of elven life. It would be like to say that you really like food, but then only ever eat breakfast. All of these religions involve the worship of multiple powers within the pantheon, although not necessarily multiple pantheons. This is the normal state of affairs in the realms. Thus, in abstract, it really is ridiculous to think of one deity of the realms becoming angry at a worshipper just for worshipping another deity. What matters to a particular realm's power is not that a follower worships someone else, most everyone in the realms worships several someone else's, but rather which other powers are venerated and which are appeased, and how serious a person's offerings and worship are to the other deities. Some pantheons even don't care if their worshippers also venerate deities from other pantheons. It's freeing, I think, especially compared to other worlds that we've seen. So why do we say that we have a patron deity? Most folk, <laughs> sorry, folk, most folk have a handful of powers that they regularly venerate, only appeasing an unpleasant power when they're entering or engaged in a situation where that deity holds sway. You know, every time I'm on a boat, I'm praying to Umbali to look the other way. Most people in the realms also eventually settle on a sort of patron deity who they are most comfortable venerating and who they hold in the greatest reverence. For me, it's Mistra. It is to this patron deity that we go when we die, our souls moving on to that divine plane for eternity, to whatever reward our faith would gain us. Now, we should briefly talk about the faithless. These are people who firmly deny any faith, or have only ever given lip service most of their lives and never truly believed in the power of the gods. <laughs> I can see some of you in the room looking at each other, and trust me, I get it. The evidence of the divine power of the gods is well, evident in everything that we do, so why would this concept even exist? But think of it in two ways. First of all, not so much that they, they don't believe, but that they believe they don't need to worship them. Faithless can mean knowing that they exist, but not wasting any of their mental or spiritual effort on them. Like the ultimate narcissist, thinking that you can pave your own way through life and that the gods are just equally narcissistic and powerful beings. Second of all, Think of it as religious propaganda. The faithless are formed into a living wall around the city of strife, in the realm of the dead, in Oenos, in the grey waste, and left there until they dissolve. The unearthly greenish mold that holds the wall together eventually destroys them. Now, not every faith warns against this, and no one living has ever seen the wall, nor been able to definitively prove its existence. And even most faithless still believe in something whether it be the mechanisms of the universe, or in nature, or the laws of science. Also, people can worship false gods, and gods that have never existed in the first place. What's important is that belief in something. Anything counts. Not just the gods that exist. And considering how hard it is to not believe in something, and considering that you have to take the wall at face value, because it's only written down in religious doctrine, and there is no physical proof of it whatsoever, and doesn't stand up to logical argument, I think we should follow another knowledgeable celebrity, and conclude that the wall doesn't exist, and is just told to scare atheists into believing the status quo. The divine mechanism for powers to rise and fall in rank operates smoothly and without anyone to control it. It accounts for the worship of followers devoted to only one deity, and the more casual worship of the average inhabitant of the realms of several or many powers. 
With the powers in competition for worship, scholarly folk have occasionally wondered why strong deities do not simply kill the weaker ones and thin the field of competition, and why any deity would choose to serve another. And people far more spiritually sophisticated than I have come up with a theory. Weaker deities sometimes serve deities higher than they are in rank because the stronger ones have promised to protect them from the divine predations of other deities. In exchange, the weaker deities provide more hands for the greater power to use towards its end. Often, especially amongst evil deities, there seems to be an almost extortionistic aspect to their relationship. Uh, perhaps, scholars speculate, weaker powers sometimes pay some amount of their divine power to stronger powers to strengthen this arrangement. Or perhaps stronger powers who are receiving a lot of worship threaten to squeeze out weaker powers or outright destroy them if the weaker deities do not swear to serve them and provide a tithe of divine power. In other words, the strong deities don't reach everyone but also want more power, and so coerce weaker deities into paying an extortion racket. Talus doesn't appeal to all furious people, but may get some power from Umberly in return. Umberly gets to continue Umberlying. I have a different theory, and this might be thinking like a wizard. But what if the divine formula has rules embedded in it? Sorry, <laughs> I lied again. More rules. Uh, that prohibits the killing of gods that aren't part of the same portfolio. Different pantheon groups, for want of a better term, have dominion over different areas of the globe. That can't be a coincidence, right? What if there's an upper limit of power that a god can achieve, and the demands of their followers that can be answered has a plateau? A demigod has limits, so it makes sense to me, at least, that the other levels of godhood have their own limits, and there are a lot of people out there. But again, that's a theory amongst other theories, and I'm more inclined to believe that our, I, as a wizard, don't have that much credibility to talk about deicide compared to a priest or monk. I'll get in touch with some of the major churches in Silvery Moon to see what answers I get back. Hopefully not imprisonment for blasphemy. But I do think that it is important and uh, somewhat comforting to note that the strong deities just can't go murdering all the weaker deities. Exactly how much worship and how many followers it takes for powers to rise or sink within the ranks is unknown. It's evident that some sort of divine formula for the rating of deific ability has been enacted by Ao, but he has never revealed it even to the powers themselves. And about this point you're probably asking, what is Ao? We'll talk about them in the next part of the lecture because anything about Lord Ao is wild. And we need some time to talk about that. For that reconvene later this week.